Hello, um, welcome to the Cello weekly webinar. Sorry for the delay. I had some um, technical issues getting started. Um, I hope you all had a wonderful new year and um, you know, here's to looking at a very bright 2021. I think it's um, gonna be some great things happening. So please uh, stay tuned and uh, make sure you tell your friends about our weekly, sorry, our weekly webinars, because um, there's going to be a lot of changes this year. And um, with the races in Georgia going the way they are, it may seem like we, the Democrats have the House, the White House, and the Senate, which means um, there's going to be some great reform to what's existing with immigration. It's going to take some time. Um, because a lot has taken place, but there will be some reform. So let's get started. There we go. Ways to connect. If you haven't connected with us, um, please connect with us either on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. YouTube has a chock full of, you know, really helpful resources, um, LinkedIn. And if you're not part of our Telegram group, please join our Telegram group. Uh, and as always, at the end of um, this presentation, we will take questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A. Do not put your questions in the chat. I'll say it again. Please put your questions, post your questions in the Q&A. Um, and that way we'll be able to, in one place, um, respond to the questions as, you know, in the order in which they were presented. Um, and as we stated, we've got a number of really good resources on our uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our channel if you find the information helpful, comment, um, share it with your friends. Um, because what we try to do is make it as informative as possible. And if there's anything you would like us to discuss or talk about, um, let us know. And we'll make sure that um, that's the type of information we will share on um, our YouTube channel as a subject. Um, and it doesn't have to be for the webinar. I'd be happy to do, you know, if there's some information on the permanent residence process you'd like me to address, we can, you know, have some short uh, informative webinar, I mean, PowerPoints on that that we can load up onto YouTube to help you out. Because that's our goal. Our goal is to make sure that the path, uh, immigration path that you're on, um, you're equipped with the, with the information you need to make uh, the smart choices. So please uh, let us know how we can be, give you more information. Today, we're gonna talk about the omni uh, omnibus bill, the backlogs and appointment scheduling, um, the president's proclamations. What does that mean now between a Trump and um, Biden presidency? Um, global news from the Department of State and some additional trends and questions. So let's get started. The omnibus uh, bill and stimulus check updates. So just to, so that everybody understands how the system in the United States works. There's a checks and balances. And so you have um, the executive branch, right? So that's the White House and all the cabinet that's associated with it. Now, the agencies that they oversee, um, they're allowed to make rules for those particular agencies. And, and the president um, can, in certain instances, make executive orders but there's a limitation as to what the president can and cannot do. You have the legislative branch, the le legislative branch, Congress, where laws are made. And so um, they are empowered to draft legislation and laws that will impact us. So the agencies cannot override what the legislative branch is exclusively um, you know, charged with, which is legislation. Then you have the judicial branch. So the judicial branch can oversee both the executive 
and the legislative branch uh, to make sure that anything that they construct, whether it's through executive orders or legislation is um, constitutional because the constitution is the law of the land. So that's our litmus test. So this is how they work. The judicial branch cannot through decisions and uh, judgments, you know, develop law. They're not permitted to do that. So each, you know, uh, branch has its, not only its um, jurisdiction or its area of authority, but it also has uh, a checks and balance from um, the other, you know, branches as well. So the omnis, omnibus bill um, extends the EB-5 program through June 30th, 2021. Processing times are still delayed, but uh, India is current. Um, so for those who are getting, uh, you know, uh, processed, um, they're able to file adjustment of status in the US. So we have a lot of people that are on H's that have decided to uh, go through the EB-5 program. Now, one of the things I do wanna say about that is that um, one of the changes you can expect is something, a revamping of the way we do our backlogs so that you know there's not unfair weights for India and China. Um, if they do that, one thing that you have to note is that there is a provision in there that protects people who are already in line. So for those who are in line, they would get that protection. So if you know of anyone that's interested in doing the EB-5 program, this is probably a good time to get started with that. And uh, there is a chance that when they seek to extend it in June, that they may raise the threshold again. So. Um, E-Verify was extended through September 2021. Um, visa workers um, was also extended through September 30th, 2021. Liberian refugees and um, let me see, here we go. Let me, there we go. Um, and then um, the H-2B expansion. So they'll be able to allocate additional visas for the H-2B seasonal, which are seasonal workers. So the stimulus checks um, as part of the CARES program provided 1,200 per adult, 500 per child. Uh, mixed status households were excluded if only one individual had a social security uh, number. The family was ineligible for funds. Um, new checks to 600 per person, adult or child, are already being deposited into uh, accounts by the IRS. The new bill retroactively makes mixed status families with one social security number holder and eligible to receive the 1200 per adult um, and 500 per child checks allocated by the CARES Act, as well as the new payments um, for the $600. But you can check your status uh, of your refund by going to this particular website. That's a little different from what was allocated before. The USCIS backlogs and appointment delays. I know many of you may have filed uh, adjustments in the month of October or November. And still awaiting your receipt notice. Well, they have stated that they um, are tremendously backlogged with that. So what you can do is if you look to the back of a check that was cashed, then the receipt number would be on the back of that check. So at least you know it's been receipted, you've got a number that you can reference. So I would either ask your attorney or if you provided the checks for the uh, adjustment that you filed, look for your checks that were cashed and look at the back of the cash checks. Um, what happened was, even though the USCIS, you've heard all year if you've been tuning into our webinars that the USCIS is, was actually in a budget crunch. So they were having some problems with finances they didn't do any layoffs for USCIS workers, 
but a lot of private contractors were laid off at the NBC. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, a lot of the contractors that typically open and um, receive, you know, the filings, they were also laid off. So that's part and parcel to the delay. The expansion um, of the premium processing fees was supposed to boost USCI's revenues and reduce backlogs, but um, they haven't rolled that out yet. And um, the USCIS recently has acknowledged the lock, lockbox delays, but not have offered any solutions. I mean, here, let's think about it from their perspective. Do you think they have any incentive right now, knowing that in two weeks, they'll all be, most of them, will be, you know, the people in charge will be removed and you'll have new people in place at these agencies to do really do anything. So it's kind of like they know they're out of a job and I don't see that they will take any action to make things better until the new administration is in place. Um, 1.3 million applicants who are looking for immigration benefits are awaiting biometrics appointments. There's a huge delay with biometrics, part and parcel because there was that period of time where they stopped, um, you know, taking appointments for biometrics. And then when they did, you had, you know, uh, very scaled back operations. So, you know, there is a delay. Um, A tremendous delay for, for the biometrics. There's a couple of lawsuits on that, no movement, nothing really moves during the Christmas time, but we may hear something uh, from the lawsuits. They're saying that it is an unjust delay. By the time the lawsuits come to play, we'll have a new administration. We'll have to see what they're going to do about the, um, the backlog in the biometrics. So the USCIS is checking CBP records and automatically rescheduling interviews if the applicant has traveled outside the US in the last 14 days to make sure that if you've traveled outside, you have um, self-secluded for 14 days before you go in person for an, in an appointment. The COVID interview protocols is you cannot enter, in a, enter into the building um, for more than 15 minutes before the scheduled interviews and 30 minutes before the oath ceremonies. You have to bring your own pens, masks are required. Um, masks with exa exhaust valves, neck gaiters or bandanas are not permitted. You must wear a proper mask. Attendance may be limited to three people per interview room. So these are some things you have to keep in mind if you're planning to go. And I think a lot of this will probably move, uh, will stay as is through the Biden administration because, um, you know, until we get COVID under, um, under check. Um, so it says that you may be asked to wait in the waiting room, um, especially in marriage-based cases, you may be interviewed separately or by video. And they say that even if the video appears off, the officer can still hear the conversations. So keep that in mind. Some field offices are conducting interviews at uh, the info pass windows in the waiting rooms, um, creating privacy concerns because you know everybody else can hear what's going on. The U.S. Uh, continues to call applicants last minute uh, to notify them they're rescheduling instead of notifying their attorney. So travel ban expansion for non-immigrants. Uh, and remember the proclamation that was supposed to end, you know, we had three of them that were supposed to end at the end of December, but they could be extended. So the president extended the proclamation, suspending the entry of non-immigrants and um, immigrants due to the COVID economic, you know, the economic impact of COVID and extended till March, 2021. We can, this is probably going to be one of the initial things that uh, President Biden um, on his first day removes. But um, it has been extended. And if you need to have more information about what these proclamations mean, you know, check out our YouTube videos that we have before because they um, actually will have the uh, 
they will have uh, the information that you need, you know, to, you know, uh, to assess what the proclamation stood for and the significance of them. And uh, it also prohibits entry of new immigrant visa holders from abroad, as well as H's, H2Bs, J1s, and L1 visa holders. We have been successful in securing um, emergency and national interest exceptions for our clients. Um, there are some things that you have to do to be eligible for that. And you've got to make sure that the evidence you submit, you know, supports whatever it is that you're trying to say is either the national interest or the emergency. And it doesn't apply if you were in the U.S. with a valid visa at the time of the proclamation, only for those who were not. Some have reported difficulties in obtaining consular appointments since the routine services have not been resumed. Um, individuals must be able to provide evidence that either the proclamation does not apply to them, don't assume that they know because all your information is of record. You're making a case for yourself when you are trying to secure an appointment. Um, and a lot of the officers aren't really familiar with the exceptions and, and uh, you know, what the emergency details are, but you can take a look at our website. We have information on cellolaw.com and see how you can make your case for either national interest waiver, the emergency, or whether you're even, you know, subject to the uh, restrictions um, of the new visa rules. So that should be very helpful. And you can share it with your friends that may be facing the same issues. Next, global news from the Department of State. Uh, the resumption of routine services um, have resumed, but will occur on a post-by-post -post basis. Countries where you know, there is a greater insurgence of COVID um, may have more limited operations than others where it's not as insidious. And um, emergency appointments are still available. And Machine readable visas are usually valid uh, within one year of payment and validity is extended through September 30th due to limited opportunities. So if you paid the fee and you're worried about not getting an appointment, there is some relief in that area. Um, consular officers can waive the in-person interview for non-immigrants in the same visa classification. Uh, Individuals with a visa expired in the last 12 months are typically waived, so you can do Dropbox. Um, the expiration period has been extended to 24 months. Remember, you have, to be you have to be applying for a visa at the same consulate where you received your initial visa. So if you got your initial H-1 visa at another consulate, you wouldn't be eligible for Dropbox. Um, the last... Week, the, the policy has been extended to March 30th, 2021. So we'll have to see how that moves forward. Additional insights and questions. Um, so the modification of the registration requirement uh, for CAP selection, um, we don't think that this is going to go forward, but um, the USCIS will use, what they proposed was they would use the same selection process for advanced degrees. Um, and there would be then random selections at wage levels. But I wouldn't worry about this issue right now because I have a strong feeling that by the time we get close to cap season, they will not uh, base the selection on wage re levels. I think they may do the registration like they did last year. I think that made sense. That way people aren't expending money and resources if they know they haven't been selected for the cap. And um, this was uh, some of the things that we talked about before we took a break for Christmas, um, that the USCIS may deny or revoke approval of subsequent new or amended if the filing is part of the petitioner's attempt to decrease the proffered wage after the cap selection. So that, again, this may not apply because this is assuming that H-1B uh, cap this year would be based on 
wage levels. And I don't think that it would, but I wanted you to do the recap of what we talked about earlier. So now we can take questions and we'll have Shaker Chella um, kind of moderating that section and take some questions. We will continue our weekly webinars. So next week, January 13th at 12 p.m. We'll have a webinar. If there's a topic you wanna hear, if there's something you want us to cover, um, email us or you know, let us know. Um, email us at info at cellolaw.com and we'd be happy to cover those topics. Please join our Cello Forum if you haven't joined it. It's a Telegram forum. And I know I took a break during um, the Christmas season, but um, back. And we've got two forums now. Um, one is for the H1 and H4 visa holders. We've got another Cella Chats that's specifically for E3 visa holders. Um, so we can target and make sure that we are disseminating information that is most relevant to those groups. And we've got the links and I'm sure um, my team will also share a link on the chats. So if you haven't joined, you can. One thing you can do, it would be really helpful. We try to do these webinars, these chats, and we spend a lot of time you know, uh, researching and getting the information to you. So if you can um, share these links with your friends, let's get a bigger group. And I just found out that the, um, if you remember, there's the bill that uh, is, head, is headed by Lawford, which is the California representative who's trying to eliminate the backlogs. Well, um, over Christmas, I found out we had, Chella Law had an intern who worked with us um, and I've known her for, since she was a kid. She then subsequently went to work for the USCIS she's now uh, a staff attorney for that particular legislator. So we'll be having a lot of, um, I guess, inside information on what's happening with the, uh, the bill to remove the backlogs and um, you know, what type of issues they're facing. So this is a great time to um, make sure you're, you, you, let your friends know to connect with us so that they can have the latest information on the visa backlogs and the new regulations and things like that. Again, connect with us. Um, I love to hear from you. Um, it's one of the uh, best parts of my job is connecting with you guys every week um, in whatever mechanism there is and hearing your challenges and making sure we can come up with strategies to make your immigration process as smooth as possible. Check out our webinars. We'll be posting some new ones um, going forward with issues that are relevant for everyone. If um, your question doesn't get answered today or you need to send us more details about, because sometimes it's hard to answer a question without looking at the documents and forms, email us at info at chelalaw.com and we'd be happy to um, answer your question. So, um, Welcome, Shaker Chala. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lakshmi. Happy New Year, everybody out there. Uh, can you listen to me? Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Probably. Okay, good. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. I hope you all had a good New Year. And um, we hope you uh, made, uh, whether you made some resolutions or not, doesn't matter. But uh, if you made, let's see if we can you know, stick to that and make it happen. If you have not made, that's good, too because that means you're doing good in whatever you're doing. You didn't need to make one. So uh, having said that, uh, you know, let's see uh, what questions do you have and uh, we'll go from there. So I'll pick up the first set of questions here coming from uh, Anik Kuma. And uh, the question is, I left my employer who filed I-140 for me in EB2 and joined full-time but my request, my previous employer filed AOS EB2 to EB3 downgrade in November. What are the chances of I-140 downgrade approval if I don't join my previous employer? Well, you have, you probably signed um, an I-485J 
an I-485, if you haven't, if you didn't submit it, because you don't, they say you don't have to submit it with a concurrent filing. Of course, we submitted it with all our filings. But um, if you haven't, then the USCIS will definitely issue an RFE asking that. That form you are signing under penalty of perjury that you have the present intent to join your employer. You have the present intent. Now, in practical purposes, because these, you know, even adjustments are taking a long time, once your I-140 is approved, two things actually, I-140 must be approved, so the downgrade has to be approved, and your 485 has been pending for 180 days, you will be able to, through AC21, portability of green cards, change employers. But, you know, um, you may not see that the new administration will enforce asking you what intent that you had, um, that you were, you did have the present intent to join the employer, but you can't do it if you have no intent, that's fraud. You have to have at least, and that's what I kept telling people, have the present intent to do it. You can change your mind later on, but you can't go into it um, just for green card purposes. All right. And uh, the gentleman, Anik, wishing everybody happy new year to the Chala team and everybody else. So next one is from Krishna Anna Pragada. Hello, Lakshmi Garu, how are you? My question is, when will USCIS again accept filing dates on table two, like last year, October 2020 to December 2020? Happy New Year. Happy New sure. Year. Um, we'll have to see. Like I said, what you know now um, is not going to be what will happen within the next few months. So what I'm doing in 2021 is... Um, I'm trying to get with officials, not only representatives in Congress, but also talk to um, the folks within the Biden administration to find out clearly what's on, you know, um, what's going to be the rollout of all their changes that they're going to take place. That are going to take place. So uh, stay tuned to our webinars and um, stay tuned to if you're part of our Telegram group. That's where we're going to, uh, you know, give out this information that we find out. All right. I uh, just wanted to uh, remind everybody to please submit your questions to the Q&A box as opposed to the chat. Uh, thank you. Next one is from Rahel Ayelu. If you work for a nonprofit organization, what does that mean for your H-1B application? Will there be any changes to your application because you work for a nonprofit, specifically like the prevailing wage requirements or the cap subject conditions? Right. So um, there are a couple of things there. Number one, if you've worked, not all nonprofits are uh, exempt H-1B organizations. There has to be a research component to, there's a very specific um, regulatory requirement. Um, and there's a couple of different ways in which a nonprofit can be cap exempt, but not that doesn't mean that all nonprofits are cap exempt, number one. Number two, um, so if you are working for a cap exempt organization and you want to subsequently work for a um, cap subject organization, you would have to go through the H-1B cap. What few people know is that while you're working for a, uh, a cap exempt organization, do you know that you can concurrently file an H-1B for uh, a cap subject organization and not have to worry about the H-1B cap? So that's, my, that's a great tip for me to you today. And then finally, there are separate wages. Sometimes uh, nonprofit organizations use alternative wage sources. Universities, there is a different uh, DOL wage um, survey for all the university 
uh, positions. So it just depends on the top of type of nonprofit. All righty. Let's go to Suresh Shastri. He says, uh, hi, Lakshmi and Shekhar Garu. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Suresh. Hi, PD, October 2010, and filed for AOS in October. A biometric schedule for this week. How long will it take to receive the EAD plus AP combo card with current delays? If I get my EAD card before 180 days time period, can I move to new employer as it is under 180 days? Not if you want to leverage the benefit of this particular adjustment of status. You can do whatever you want. Um, here's a couple of things. Number one, because this has been a mis big misconception on the H1 versus use of EAD. Anyone can use the H1 or EAD for the petitioning employer, for your current petitioning employer, without any consequence. If you use your EAD for someone other than your H1B employer, you are in violation of your H1B status and therefore um, you're no longer on H1B. So if anything happens to your adjustment of status, if for any reason it gets denied, you will be out of status. You can't rely on the H1B. That's issue number one. Issue number two, you can always, you can change employers right now. You'll just have to go through the green card process again. If you wanna benefit from this adjustment and not have to go through the green card process again, you have to wait for the I-140 to be approved and for the adjustment to be pending for 180 days. Both those things have to happen. Not one, both. Okay. Uh, let's go to Anil. Uh, question, can we travel to overseas now without any issues on E3 visa? As we heard that the Trump administration has passed a new order for the travel on job holder visas? Um, if your visa is valid, you can, I mean, there may be other travel restrictions based on COVID, um, but the only issue is, you know, for those people who are waiting for biometrics for whatever reason, if you've traveled, you know, the biometrics may be delayed, but I don't know of people with valid visas having any issues traveling and returning back to the United States. Okay. Uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee. I'm planning to go H-1B stamping. My LCA wage is 80K for L2 level. Is that 80K wage sufficient? Current position, will there any issues going to H-1B stamping? Um, so I guess question number one is, did you have a stamp before? So are you going for Dropbox? If you didn't have a stamp before, are you trying to see if um, you can do an emergency appointment or um, you're in the national interest? I would suggest if you're going to do anything like that, wait till the new administration takes place and there's some guidance on, you know, how they're gonna view the wages. It should not be an issue, um, especially because of, uh, you know, some of the challenges that have been brought forth on the increased wage levels. But I would wait till after the new administration comes into play and then um, we'll be able to give you some guidance on how that would affect any visa processing. Just two weeks. All right, there's a question from Tuba. Can you throw light on green card in regards for spouse? What do you, can you be more specific? Um, do you mean a spouse sponsoring you for a green card or applying for a green card for your spouse. I don't, I need more specification to the question. Yeah, you can send a detailed email to info at chalala.com and uh, be glad to, you know, reply to that email in detail. All right, let's go to Jay Ratnam Pillay. Happy New Year to the Chalala group. I'm a permanent resident and traveling back to the U.S. on January 11th. 
But this trip, my wife who has B1, B2 visa is coming back with me. We will be intending to stay till June 17 before we head off due to her six months restriction. Will the president proclamation continue or can be canceled once Biden comes into office? Any indications? He's got a bunch of questions. That's the yeah. first one. I would say, you know, um, I think a lot of the proclamations, especially the executive orders, will be null and void um, on the date of President Biden swearing in. Um, how that's going to roll out, you know, there is one thing that is changing the regulation. There's another thing about implementing the new rule and rolling it out in the midst of a pandemic and all the other challenges that we're having. I would say stay tuned with any questions that, and you, I'm not saying this to, uh, and, and anyone that's listened to my webinars knows that I don't um, at any time try to kind of, you know, uh, avert or avoid a question. But I'm just saying this because I do know that in two weeks, there's going to be changes and probably about a week, we'll get to hear of some of them. So um, whatever I tell you now is not going to be true in maybe three weeks. So um, that's why I hold off. And then, then you can make an informed strategic choice as to what you want to do going forward. Uh, so his next second question is, if we want to apply for extension of stay, would that be possible? If who wants to apply? His wife? I think so, because his, his initial introduction was, I'm a permanent resident traveling back to the U.S. on January 11th. But in this trip, my wife, who has a B1B visa, is coming back with me. We will be intending to stay till June 17th before we head off due to a six months restriction. So I guess extension for her. Right. So, um, yeah, you could probably file an extension. And, you know, um, because you're a green card holder versus a U.S. citizen, of course, you know, the, the idea that down the road that she can apply for um, adjustment of status along with the I-130, unless there's a change in legislation, you know, is um, not going to happen. But you should be able to apply for the extension. Remember that six month, um, you know, delay or the, till March may not be there if President the President elect Biden uh, revokes those proclamations. So just to uh, uh, put things in perspective, he says uh, she is a Kazakhstani Kazakhstani citizen. I believe. So his other question is, is there a possibility of we applying for a PR while in the States by adjusting the status? I know for the fact that we cannot have the intent to apply for PR, but if we stay over three months and then have intent, right. that'd be possible. There's not an immediate, there has to be an immediate visa available. Um, so, you know, there is a, not a major, but there is a slight backlog for permanent residents. So you, you would have to wait to see how long she's here and whether um, there is a, an immediate visa available uh, from the time you filed the I-130. So you may be able to file the I-130 and then file it for consular processing. And then if she's still here, maybe she changes to an F1 or some other status. Um, when the visa becomes available, when it's current, you can apply for an adjustment of status. All right, Mr. Pillay, if you need further information or assistance, just send an email to Info Chalala. We're glad to follow up. Thank you. Let's go to Setal K. Which one is recommended between H4 EAD and AOS EAD for derivatives? Currently, derivative is currently work, working using H4 EAD. I think you can use either. I would maintain your H-4 status. Your H-4 status is not dependent on whether you use your AOS EAD or H-4 EAD. Um, the reason is, and I was just trying to explain this yesterday on the tele to the Telegram group, H-4 is not um, predicated on employment. It's not an employment-based status. It is a derivative. 
So as long as the H1 is maintaining status and doing all the things that they should, the H4 maintains status. The H4 can use the EAD on their H4, or they can use the, uh, you know, their adjustment of status EAD, either one. And if you've got the H4 EAD, I don't know why you wouldn't want to continue using that until, you know. Well, here, here, here is a follow-up information from this person. Says, what is the exact official? Uh, no, I think, uh, let's say where is, I think I already read that. She came up with another one. Uh, so, I think that's obviously if I if what is the exact official status if I use AOS EAD? My H4 extension is valid for three years. Can I go back to H4 status if I used EAD in between before my next H H4 extension based on my spouse H1 renewal? Right, using your EAD doesn't necessarily change your status, your dual intent. You can intend to reside here temporarily. You can intend to reside here permanently. Your H-4 status remains valid until your spouse, as long as your spouse's H-1B remains valid. All right. Seto, uh, if you need more in, uh, information, just send us an email, info at All right. Jay Raman Pillay, thank you very much for that comment. He says, excellent advice. Sagar Kulkarni. Can you go back on H-1B after using the EAD, which was issued as I have a pending I-485? Right, so if you're using the EAD for someone other than your H-1B employer, you're no longer on H-1B status. Can you go back, you know, you know uh, you'd have to file, um, you wouldn't be able to change status because you can't change from an adjustee to an H-1B. Um, but you would be able to file an H-1B, perhaps not subject to the cap. You'd have to process a visa overseas and then come back in. Um, and so, you know, if you're using the EAD for your current H-1B employer, then that's not a problem. But if you're using the EAD for someone other than your H-1B employer, then you have violated your H-1B status. All right, let's go. Kamlesh Patel is asking, what's the validity of 485 EAD? If you're working on the EAD and can you work while the extension is in progress? Well, you can work, um, if you've got an H-1B extension, you can work for 240 days on your H-1B. Um, that's an I-9 regulation. So you've got the 240 day rule will allow you to work on your H-1B. You don't need to change to your EAD. If it goes beyond the 240 days, yeah, you could probably work on your e and as long as you're working for your H-1B employer. They would have right. to do some re-I-9ing. Um, you can't just use whatever employment authorized card you have. The employer goes through what's called an I-9 process where they verify the employment of all their employees. So you can, you can only use uh, the documentation that you presented to them. So they may have to go through that process again, but um, that's that's the down and dirty of EADs and H-1Bs. All right, let's go to um, Arun Arun. Will the new employer can file perm processing before joining and will they have any issues like taxes to pay based on Future employee wages or future employee wages. Basically, I'm looking for looking to new employer file perm processing before I join. Is that possible? That is. Um, you you can absolutely do that. Uh, there's no taxes or anything that the employer would have to worry about. The only issue is, um, and we're going to be having. Uh, I'm going to be doing a permanent residence uh, FAQ for the E3s in. I think it's either this weekend or next weekend um, on a Sunday. And I'm going to be going over what the permanent residence process is in detail. So I'm sure that the e since the E3s are joining um, this particular webinar, I'm sure the E3s won't mind if you join that one. But I go through ability to pay. You know, the employer must demonstrate ability to pay from the date the perm is filed till the I-140. 
the most, the typical way most employers show ability to pay is they are paying the employee the proffered wage. If they are not paying the employee the proffered wage because you're doing it for prospective before you join the employer, then they have to make sure that their tax returns for that year, uh, their net income is uh, greater than the wage that's offered on your firm. Okay, I just want to go back to Sagar Kulkarni, who had asked, can, I, can you go back on H-1B after using the EAD, which was issued as I have a pending I-485. He's following up saying, for downgrading cases, when can someone change an employer by invoking AC-21 safely? I know that I-485 becomes portable after 180 days of the application. Uh, you're, you downgraded. You've got a new I-140 pending. I-140's got to be approved. Doesn't matter if you had a previous I-140. The I-140 that was filed for this particular adjustment has to be approved. And the I-485 has to be pending for 180 days. People think that just because they had a previous I-140 approved, ah, I just have to wait for 180 days. No, both those things have to take place with that particular adjustment of status. Yeah, so that's what he was saying. But you also recommend waiting for 180 days after the EB3 I-140 is approved, which you said yes. Well, no, I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't have to be after the I-140 is approved, okay? These are not um, consecutive conditions. These are simultaneous conditions, okay? That means the I-140 has to be approved and the 485 has to be appending for 180 days. So let's say the I-140 was approved uh, within 60 days. The I-140 was approved in 60 days. Uh, but the I-45 is still pending. Once the I-45 was pending 180 days, because you filed them both together, the I-140 was approved in 60 days, whatever, what is it, 130 days um, has not passed since both have been pending. Once the additional 130 days takes place, then you can leverage AC-21. All right. We're going to go to Shruti Khaitan. Khaitan. Hi, this is Shruti. My H-1B visa is under process and I'm working with the same company. I have a valid B-2 visa for 10 years. My, H my husband is in U.S. with I-140 approved and I'm planning to apply for H-4 in India. Is it a good option to fly on B2 and file COS either for H1 or H4? Well, first of all, um, when you enter on a B2 visa, you're, you, are, um, you are making the representation by the entry that you intend to return to your home country. You cannot change status within the US. I think it's within 90 days. Um, and if you change status afterwards, you know, they still may question you. If you are eligible to get, if you've never ha held the H4 status before, if you're eligible, you know, if you want to, if you've held either the H1B visa before or the H4 before, I would use whichever one you have had a visa for before and see if you can leverage the Dropbox. Because if you've had a visa that has expired within the past 24 months, that was issued by the same country, same visa issued by the same country, you can leverage the Dropbox. If that does not apply to you, see if you would qualify for an emergency um, visa, either through your H-1B or your H-4, whichever has the strongest argument. I would probably think that your H-1B, if your employer can show that, um, you know, that there is some economic harm by you not being able to come here and perform the work. I think she just asked a follow up, or should I get the H4 stamping and then enter? Yes, either the H4 or the H1B. Like I said, if you've had the visa before and it expired within 24 months and it was issued by the same country, you may be eligible for Dropbox. Okay. Let's go to. Satish Sirikonda. Hi, I'm currently a FTE working on H1B with the university as a software developer. 
I'm planning to do PhD course with same university as I'm getting 90% tuition fee waived being an employee. I have a couple of questions. Does that impact my current H-1B status? No, you can study as an H-1B visa holder as my long as you're continuing to work 40 hours a week. My employer has not initiated my GC process yet, but might do that by end of this year as my H-1B max out date is April 2024. If I'm able to complete my PhD by 2024, can I change my category to EB1 anytime after filing GC? If at all, all my I-140 got already approved, if I'm still with the same job and employer. Right, so you can have many paths to roam. If you have, um, let's say you file the GC under EB2, um, and later on, you know, uh, you qualify for the EB1. Now, EB1, just because you have a PhD, doesn't automatically make you qualified for the EB1. It's extraordinary ability. There's also outstanding researcher and professor. So you would have to see if you uh, meet the other criteria of those classifications. If you do, um, you could file another I-140 um, under EB1 and utilize your previously approved I-140 priority date um, for the subsequent filing. And the last uh, is that all in least scenario, in any case, if I lose job, I miss my PhD, can I convert my visa back status to F1? Yes. All right. And I think that's probably, yep. One more question or? No, I got a couple of questions. You got, how much time do you have? One. Oh. One. So I think we'll just stop at whatever questions. I've got five more questions here. So I would appreciate if, you know, that's all we can answer. So if uh, you have a question you haven't put in or a follow-up question, please send an email to info at All right. So and, and don't Shaker, post any more Shaker, questions. If you're, if you're going to, you always download the questions. If you're going to download it, download it as a CVS file. So that way I can, try to respond to some of the questions because it has their email address on it. So um, with the registration, so I can respond to them that way. Okay. Let's go to uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, we have applied for H1B and H4 EAD renewals on July 10th with premium processing. They have sent all receipt notices, but not the notice for premium processing. H-1B is approved on November 10th, but they have not approved H-4 or H-4 EAD, even though the fingerprints were taken on September 20th. Mm. Check for PP was issued by attorney's office. Can we cancel the PP check now, or do we wait for the USCIS to send the check back? Thanks. Right. Um, I would check with your attorney's office. So you're, you're, you filed the H and the H4 in premium processing. The H1B was approved, right? So was that approved in premium processing? Well, it says um, they sent all receipt, but not the notice for premium processing. I don't know. Do they send a separate notice for premium processing? If the H1B is no, already the notice approved. should say on if his H1B receipt, num receipt notice should say it should come from premium processing. They don't send a separate one for premium processing. The, the notice itself, the receipt notice is so from if, premium if processing. If the H-1B is, uh, is approved, that, that notice should have whether it is premium processing. Yeah, I mean, if it's approved, it must be premium processing. Okay. Just look at the notice once again, uh, gentleman or lady, whoever the person asked the question. And if there's a follow-up question, just send an email, info at shallow law, please. Uh, next anonymous attendee, for AC1 portability, the new job has to be similar. Would someone who had been who had been filed a green card for title management analyst position, healthcare, move to a new job where the title is quality assurance analyst, healthcare? Would it qualify as valid job portability under AC21? Right. So um, the current Trump administration had issued some guidance on what is same or similar. It's much more narrow than uh, what was envisioned earlier. Before, what I would do is um, look at the job duties under your PERM application. 
make sure that some of those job duties, which I would imagine they would be given, you know, the relationship of the two uh, job titles you just outlined. I'm, I'm very familiar with both of them. So there's a lot of overlapping job duties. So as long as, you know, in the description, um, especially when you submit um, your I-45J to show that you've ported, uh, you just want to make sure you map it so that there's a lot of similarities. Okay. I'm going to go to, let's see. Here is a Rahel ILU, I think it's just following up. Uh, thank you for so much for answering my first question. Following up, is there a website to get more information about nonprofit specific wage level requirements? I'm asking for a friend and the organization they work for is Girl Scouts US, if that helps. Also, what happens if there is a time gap between the end of your STEM OPT and the start of your H1B status? Thank you again. Right, um, you have the grace period. You wanna make sure it's filed at least within the grace period. Um, you don't want to file after the grace period, otherwise they won't be eligible to change status in the U.S. And I'm pretty sure that the Girl Scouts um, have access to an independent wage survey, which they use. Um, so I wouldn't think that that would um, be a problem for them to outline or identify a wage uh, that using resource that they have for H-1B purposes. All right, so here's the last question for this afternoon. Uh, it's a follow-up from Suresh Shastri. He says, following up from an earlier question, as my AOS is pending currently, can I move to a new employer on a separate H1 and use my EAD from previous employer once 180-day period passed? Say that again. Following up from my earlier question, as my AOS is pending currently, can I move to a new employer on separate H1 and use my EAD from previous employer once 180 day period passed? Remember the I-140, the answer is yes, as long as the I-140 is approved and the um, adjustment's been pending for 180 days. So you can first get transferred on the H and then leverage AC-21 if those conditions have been met. All right. I think that's all. If I had missed anybody, I apologize, but uh, just send a follow-up email. If I missed your question, your question or if you want to ask a follow-up question. And uh, that's it. Thank you. And, uh, and no. we'll try to, uh, I'll try to post some of the answers um, within the Telegram group as soon as we download the questions uh, that we haven't gotten to. And uh, please join us next week. Um, like I said, this is going to be, you know, as we get into 2021, it's going to be very riveting because we're going to be having all these positive changes that are coming up in the immigration uh, realm. And so with that, we'll make sure not only to share the changes, but to outline how you can leverage strategies so you can achieve your immigration objective. Thank you again for connecting all those who are newly con you know, connected um, and those who have been, you know, uh, attending every week. I appreciate you coming back. Again, Happy New Year. I'm glad to start off a uh, new 2021 webinar series and uh, really enjoy connecting with you in this capacity. Thank you, Shaker, for Thank you. Happy New Year Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Happy New Year.